And today's word is about how God wants to prosper us in spite of the world, the economy, inflation, and everything that is going on around us. Now, if you're watching this, you might be in fear because of the economy, what's going on in America and the West right now. And you might be caught up into survival patterns of the flesh that tell you to live in bondage to the ruler of this world, to strive and toil and live in a spirit of anxiety and fear about how you're going to survive all the time. But I just want to remind you and encourage you that when we take the Lord's yoke upon us, it is easy and light. And that we live in the spirit of fear and not by his Holy Spirit dwelling within us where we need to ask him to give us peace and strength, sometimes minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day when we lose it again, which is only natural and human and God's not angry at us. That spirit robs us of our peace and our joy and our happiness. And so today I'm going to do something a little bit different where I'm going to read quite a bit of Matthew 6. And I'm not kidding when I tell you my Bible opened straight to it when I picked up the New King James. And I'm going to start at the end of chapter 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, expressing himself through us individually and collectively as the ecclesia, the assembly of God in this world, as Frank Viola put it. And the kingdom of God is multifaceted, it's marvelous, it's Christ in all his glory expressed in the world through the bride, his church, which friends is not a building, you know, the church is us, the priesthood of all believers, of those believers who are truly filled with the spirit of God. Remembering that it's the spirit within us that overcomes our flesh and not our own willpower and strength. And so what does that mean to seek first his righteousness? To me, one thing it means is living for the glory of God alone. His glory, his expression of himself in this world through us. And we may be in the wilderness, a season of wilderness with God. We may have been there a long time and it may be really difficult. But what I found in my own is that he was sort of breaking the flesh so that his spirit could pour forth within me and I could live in peace. And just like the Israelites in Exodus, which I had read recently, you know, they were supposed to spend, estimates are from two weeks to two years in the wilderness, but it took 40 years. And we don't need to judge or criticize ourselves if we've been there a long time. We just need to remember that God has a purpose for the wilderness. There is a purpose in the pause. If our fears are coming up financially or about survival in the world, it's because he wants us to give them to him, to offer them to him, to ask him to replace our fears with his peace, to comfort us. What he's doing and what he was doing in the wilderness with Israel is teaching them to rely on him and not the outside world. They had been in extreme slavery and oppression for hundreds of years before he delivered them from Egypt. And that time in the wilderness was a time where he was molding them, shaping them, transforming them, conforming them to his image. And that that is a process, it's unique and individual for each of us. And from what I've learned, friends, the sooner we can surrender to it, the faster it goes. Which means surrendering to him. God may be using us right now as an example to people around us when we aren't living in prosperity. To see how we still love him, we still praise him. We still turn to him in spite of the ways that our lives may be looking right now, which is a powerful witness of what it means to be a follower, a true disciple of Christ in this world. And again, when he does prosper us and delivers on all the promises he's given us individually, you know what those are for you. Again, it's for his glory and not our own. And sometimes we can turn money or success or possessions into false idols because the world tells us that's what we need to be happy. And of course, we all need to eat, that's normal. But like he said in Matthew 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, that your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? We are God's priceless treasures. The body of Christ is his priceless possession, his beloved, and his passion is for us. 
And he teaches us through adversity and challenges when things around us look like they're never going to work out, how to put our faith in it. And like he said in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And a lot of us, when we fall into those survival patterns in the world, living by the fear that the ruler of the world wants us to be in bondage to, we end up putting our treasures in this world. And the Lord knows, even if we can't see it, where our treasure is, where our hearts really are. And so when we go through difficult and challenging seasons, he's purifying our hearts that our treasure may be him. And when our treasure is Christ, when we treasure him, when all our love and adoration and worship is of him, then he knows he won't lose us when he delivers on his promises and delivers us into our own personal promised land. Which, I'm sorry to say, friends, may not look like becoming multimillionaires and storing up wealth and treasures in barns. And some months back, when I took a break from this channel, I prayed a prayer that said, Lord, give me what I need and not what I want. And I encourage you to pray the same, but I will let you know it turned my whole life upside down. And he ended up taking away things I really thought I wanted, I really thought I needed, things that were not good for me and wouldn't have been good for me in the long term, which later became apparent. The other thing is that when the Lord blesses us, he wants us to share with others. The early church did not store up treasures. Many people sold their land, pooled their money collectively, and lived as the ecclesia, the true church, the assembly of God. And our modern churches look very different from that, not that God's treasures aren't there too. Wherever his Holy Spirit-filled believers are, there he is also. But I think the greatest thing, if you take anything away from this message today, is to remember that the Lord is the treasure. The presence of the Lord and his spirit dwelling within us is the greatest blessing on this earth. And so if you're struggling to do that, know that that's totally a normal part of the process. We're all going to struggle with this throughout our lives as we go on our deeper journey with Christ and are conformed more and more to his image over time. But that all we have to do is just spend a little time with the Lord, listening. And if you're struggling to know how to do that, you're struggling with your will, I encourage you to sign up for my email list at the link below and there's a free download, an ebook I created that's sort of a guide to help you assess where you're at and learn to rest in God's love and peace and wait for his provision and hear his voice more clearly. And wherever you're at, friends, God bless you and keep you. May he provide for all your needs and may you learn to rest in peace in the waiting period and to grow and be conformed to his image for his greatest glory in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.